So I, I wanted to, you know, begin basically by, by telling you guys a story of personal revival. Um, a lot of people who know me know me for planting, for coaching, for training, for preaching and stuff like that. Um, but what they don't know is that if I could choose just one thing to teach on for the rest of my life, it would be this, this teaching right now in the next hour. Uh, and the reason that I say that is because uh, I've just experienced personal revival in my own life over the last five years, four, four and a half years since my daughter was born. Uh, I had a personal revival in the midst of suffering, in the midst of a crisis a few years ago. Um, I've always been able to hear the voice of God, right? So like when, when I came to faith, the Lord gave me this vision of my life going down the drain. And I knew the day that I became a Christian that the Lord just loves, you know, to speak to his people. And uh, during the first seven years that Molly and I were married, we actually went to a very charismatic church of Pasadena where Pastor Michael Coe trained us really just to hear the voice of God uh, in our lives. And we grew a lot in, in our leadership at that church. So I think my, my problem uh, at that point had it, wasn't, it wasn't an issue of like my ability to hear the voice of God. It was more my willingness to give God space to speak. So I think I've always found it difficult uh, uh, to have a consistent prayer life. And I would say that most of my, my prayer life, especially when I became a Christian, I mean, when I became a leader at the fellowship at UCLA back in 1999, uh, all my prayer life became very outward focused. In other words, uh, Lord, uh, what would you have me preach? Lord, what would you have me lead in Bible study? Uh, and I don't know if, if you guys uh, have, have experienced that, that type of dynamic in your prayer life with the Lord. In other words, uh, a lot of my prayer life was, what will you have me do? Now, to his credit, the Lord was very gracious in relating with me at that level in those types of prayers. But that inconsistent prayer life uh, stopped working for me when my daughter was born back in December of 2015. Um, what ended up happening was my wife had major issues of bleeding uh, when Mina was born and she was in and out of the hospital from uh, January, February, and then parts of March in, uh, in the beginning of 2016. And I found myself, man, just like really angry with God, not, not, not knowing how to like relate with the Lord because so much of my life with God, again, was related to ministry and ministry tasks or going to God for the sake of the ministry. So I found myself angry. I found myself uh, hurt. And I had like, uh, I just didn't have categories for how to relate God to God at that level. It seems a little bit extreme, but that's just, you know, that's just what it was, what I was feeling at the time. And I think it began impacting my relationship with my wife and the way that I was treating my son. Uh, I, I couldn't take my, my newborn babies crying. You know, it was just, it was just a very traumatic crisis suffering type of experience for me. And that began to change for me one Sunday when one of the elders at my church gave a sermon about prayer and about personal revival and about how to, how to be with God in the midst of suffering. And he, he talked about prayer, like uh, he said, life of, of the life of prayer or life in general is like a WWF wrestling match. Now, how many of you guys watch wrestling as kids or like know what I'm talking about? Right. Uh, I used to pretend, you know, that I was the rock or like Hulk Hogan back in the day. And my, my brother and I would, you know, would have pretend matches in on, on my, on my parents' bed. And we used to get in trouble for that. But what he used, uh, what, what pastor David, the elder at the church said was, um, you know, uh, life is like a WWF match, like a wrestling match. And the great thing is that you don't have to get in, into the ring by yourself, right? Like li life will tell you that that's, that's what it is. You're just fighting, you know, like to survive. But, but life with God, especially your life with prayer is like having Jesus in the corner and then praying is like uh, tagging Jesus and he comes into the ring with you and you and Jesus have a handicap match against the enemy. Now, for those of you who, who know wrestling, a WWE, WWF, as it was known back in the day, a handicap match is when two, two people go up, up against one and they kind of like, you know, jump them. Um, and I just love, I love that, that image, right? Uh, mostly because I, I, I like kicking butt uh, and, and I needed uh, an encouragement that made sense um, 
in the midst of feeling like I was getting my butt kicked, you know, because of everything that had been happening with my wife and my daughter. So one of the, the first things that, that I had to do, I think, was just really be honest with myself. And I recognized, I think immediately as, as Pastor David was talking that I had a child, I was childish in my ability to pray consistently. Okay. And I had, a, I had a behavior problem and I needed to remind myself to act right. So uh, the, my inspiration for, for thinking about that, of like, you know, acting right was my son, because in the moment he was having a lot of uh, behavior issues at school. Uh, he was biting people. I guess he thought he was in an episode of The Walking Dead or something like that. He was like a biter. Uh, so we put him on this behavior chart. And after about a month, you know, Santiago changed his behavior. Now at the beginning, it was like, buddy, how many timeouts did you get today? And he's like, oh, I only got three timeouts today. And I'm like, dude, what are you talking about? You know, and then in, uh, by the end of that, he had changed his behavior. So I was like, you know, if, if my son can, can change the way that he behaved by have, having a, a behavior chart, uh, maybe I can make myself a prayer chart. And I'll show you guys this later. So uh, if I can, I have a copy of it down here. I printed it out. I'll show you. Um, so I just put, you know, prayer chart, and I had my name up at the top, and I just began to commit to praying five times uh, a week for 30 minutes each, uh, just to spend time with Jesus and almost like retrain myself to have times times with the Lord. And I began to do that, and I I, I also got myself. A, a tool to help me stay focused because I mean, part of my problem was a, I wasn't praying and I needed you know a behavior chart to help me keep track of it and two uh, my prayer times were all over the place so I got this book called Seeking God's Face for my professor at, at uh, Fuller I was at Fuller Seminary at the time and it just really helped me go through the Psalms and really help like structure my prayer life um, and then I told myself if if I pray five times a week for 30 minutes I'm going to treat myself to something that I like on the Sabbath, right? So for me, it became like a performance thing in the same way that for my son, going to Baskin Robbins, you know, was the thing that he got on Saturday. If he acted right and didn't get timeouts for me, it was, it was going to be whatever treat that I wanted that week. Um, and something began to happen. After a few weeks, I noticed that 30 minutes wasn't enough, right? And after a few weeks, I noticed that I didn't need a prayer chart, I didn't need treats on the Sabbath to motivate me anymore. And it's at that point that I, I began to feel the sense that Jesus was, was more than enough for me. And after uh, a few months, I just realized uh, the presence of God in my life was what I was, what I was motivated, uh, uh, what, what was, was what was motivating me to enter into prayer. And instead of just praying for ministry, vision, and task, instead of just praying to hear uh, to, to, to engage God about my problems. My, my prayer times became more about just seeking God himself and being in the presence of God. And my, my prayer times became, became more about, Lord, help me experience more of you right now. Lord, help me see your face. Help me, help me just feel your presence in the room today. And as I do, drew closer to God, I was reminded, I think of like Isaiah and Isaiah 6, when when Isaiah enters the throne room of God, when he sees the vision of the throne room, he realizes his own depravity. So the more that I prayed, the more I, I began to see the brokenness in my life, the more I, I began to repent and seeking God's holiness in my life. And, and it's not like I was, you know, off in like crazy sin or anything like that. I'm just saying, you know, like there were things in my life that I needed accountability for. So I got an accountability partner. So it became this thing where at first I was seeking God out of crisis because I was not wanting to kick, get my butt kicked anymore. And then it became this just like personal revival time of just seeking the Lord's face every day for the sake of being reminded of my love for God and God's love for me. And since then, I think my life has never been the same, you know, and I've, I've, I've had a commitment over the last five years to not have a, uh, a, a prayerless existence. In other words, to, to, to always engage the Lord in prayer, to have my quiet times, to get up, when my kids are in school at 5 a.m. so that I can spend time with God. Uh, Andrew, you're a student. That probably sounds ridiculous to you. But I uh, get up at 5 a.m. Uh, to pray. I still use Seeking God's Face uh, to listen to worship music, to be in the presence of God uh, before I cook myself breakfast, make myself coffee, before I make the kids breakfast, 
before I make them their lunch, and before I take my son to school, I've spent time with the Lord. Why? Because I just want to experience the Lord's presence and be reminded of the Lord's um, presence in my life in the midst of the, of the crazy world. And I'm wondering if that's what people are needing during this time of pandemic, right? Where so many of us have been uh, used to kind of just going and going and going. I think that this time of COVID-19 is exposing people's prayer life, either the lack of prayer or, or how much they've been praying. Because uh, for me, the only thing that has sustained me uh, is my prayer life. So most of what we're going to be talking today has to do with relationship with God and being with God and being in the presence of God. But, bef but before we go there, is there any part of this story that resonates with you? And if so, how? Now, I have that, I think, open in, uh, I think I made a chart, right, or something like that. If you guys want to maybe take a minute uh, to write your name into that chart, and uh, we'll, we'll, res we'll respond to each other. Maybe write down, does any of that part, any part of that story resonate with you? Uh, how so? And then we'll have a uh, five-minute conversation about that. Anything that I just said, just in relation of what, what does your prayer life look like? You know, uh, do most of your prayers around ministry, ministry tasks, or are you really relating with Jesus at, at a level of just really wanting to seek his face and feel his love for you? Taylor, would you mind uh, sharing with us? first yeah um so i feel like i also struggle a lot with having consistent prayer like a couple days it'll be really good and then a couple days it'll be like oh, i prayed for like a minute and that's all i felt like i did um and so like having consistent like quality times of prayer is something that like i really like um and then i think a lot of my prayers focus on ministry related things and not necessarily like just being with god or even like personal focus so you, you resonate a little with what I'm what I'm talking about here. Yeah. Does anybody else resonate at that level? Lisa, you unmuted yourself. Yeah, I think I'm the same exact place that you described. I just I had a surgery in January, and although I had a lot of downtime, I really felt like I was kind of distanced. A little bit from the Lord and then came back to campus about three weeks before two or three weeks before they closed it so I was so excited about being on campus but it was kind of more performance I feel like like a performance attitude rather than yes I'm really related to do I mean I feel like I was really ready to do ministry again but then when this happened just right after I got back on campus I feel like God just kind of took my legs out from under me again and so ever I feel like I've just not been really Prayer life has been just one of what I wrote, just really a struggle yeah. for a while to just be consistent and asking the Lord first rather than just going and doing what I think I need to do and then asking for him to, you know, approve it later. Yeah. Phil, where were you at before, before the pandemic with your prayer life? You know, I feel like over the last, so I, I've been, um, I was in a heavy MPD mode, like right prior to everything i was actually in a a sprint yeah uh, so like it was like for four straight weeks 30 hours a week of doing mpd so god was like working on me over time like even prior to like the pandemic and all of a sudden like i'm like you know i just need these small faithful steps you know like mpd is part of that too right yeah. small, small faithful steps of obedience to god and it's the same thing with my prayer life that he's been, God's been talking to me a lot about. And uh, my spiritual director, uh, he has been like talking to me a lot about that. And I, I get really, um, uh, I don't know, I get a little like work anxiety where I'm like, oh, I just, I'm, I'm being lazy or this or that. And then he's just like, are you though? Are you being lazy? Why don't you just recognize that you're, you're Doing the good, faithful, small steps to follow Jesus. And um, anyways, that's kind of where I've been at. Okay. Andrew, you were resonating a little bit about relationship with God and not just having this, you know, going to God to solve crisis. Yeah, it just seems like a lot of times, like, I'll like, get closer to God, like, when I'm having issues in my life and then like once they start resolving then like 
that prairie life kind of disappears, quiet time <laughs> kind of doesn't happen as frequently as it should, and kind of seems like I just always only turn to God like when I kind of need him instead of like constantly uh, wanting a relationship with him. Yeah, so like uh, we go into crisis mode and then we go to God, but then when things are good, and I think we could all relate to that at some level, right? Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I, and I think I've, I've noticed that pattern. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. I, I've noticed that that type of pattern, uh, both in student leaders and then in, in the life of my life, my personal life, and the life of my colleagues, right? That when things get hard, we'll go to God. When things are good, we're just praying to God about um, the things that we want to see in ministry, our ministry strategy, and, and all of that. But, you know, when, when, you look, when you look at the story of Scripture, it's a story of, of God just wanting to spend time with his people, right? Like when we think about uh, God's desire to be with Adam and Eve in the garden, uh, just walking with them, you know, in the garden, and then they mess that up. And then, you know, the book of Exodus is all about God wanting to dwell with his people again. You know, like he, he calls Moses to go out into the wilderness for what? Well, so they can go worship and be with God, you know? And the whole story actually of the book of Exodus, where the book of Exodus is actually going like the purpose of the book of exodus is is this return uh uh almost a return to eden in in the sense of god's presence being with the people right so like at the end of the book the glory of god comes back down in the midst of the people into the da tabernacle and that's that's one of the main purposes uh or the aims of the book of exodus and then you look at like um Leviticus and Deuteronomy and some of these other books that talk about all these holiness codes. And to us, it's like, man, like, why, why are they so preoccupied, you know, on the law and holiness? Well, they were preoccupied with it because now God was in their presence and they were full of sin. God is a holy and righteous and awesome God. And if you want to be in his presence, you need to be holy. But all of that had to be to do with dwelling with God and God dwelling with them. Um, and then they got, you know, the, the bright idea of the temple and the glory of God comes into the temple, right? And I think we see that, uh, the dedication of the temple. They mess that up, right? And then you look at the book of Ezekiel, and the Holy Spirit, the glory of God, leaves the temple. But all of this, this is the story of God wanting, you know, to dwell with his people. Um, and then the ultimate story, right? Like God in the flesh, uh, God with us, uh, Jesus basically coming down, and, and dwelling with the people. And then when, when, when Jesus is crucified, he said, you know, the, the Holy Spirit comes on the believers. And again, the presence of God. And then you look at the, the, the book of Revelation in chapter 21, that God's people will, will, God will dwell with his people once again. Again, going back to the original purpose of God just wanting to be with his peeps. But for some reason, um, like we know that story, right? Like, like that's the, the, the meta narrative of scripture is, God wants to dwell with his people, but we get caught up in the crisis, in the ministry. Now, just to say ministry is not a bad thing, you know. I, I've talked to Phil. I know the, the, the type of ministry uh, that Phil does. Uh, Phil knows the type of ministry that I do. Ministry is a good thing. Like, we're invited into that, but we can never mistake ministry and doing and all these tasks for relationship. And I think that that's where we go wrong. And when you look at uh, a scripture, especially that we're going to be looking at, at the New Testament in a, in, a, in a bit, Jesus is almost always reminding his disciples of relationship, relationship with him and relationship with the Father. So let, let me bring up uh, PowerPoint. Actually, it's a PDF format. Um, what are you guys seeing right now? Jesus in the county, Jesus in pandemic, right? Um, so when we look at scripture, right, like we get passages uh, in John 15, where it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you could do nothing. Right? Like th think about that. Apart from me, you could do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch that is thrown uh, away and withers. But um, I, I love that line, like apart from me, you could do nothing. And I just wonder if, if we take Jesus literally there, you know, um, if, if I were to share with you all uh, some of the implications from this passage, I'm totally hitting fast forward here because I want to say to get through all the passages. But if you're not abiding and dwelling in Jesus, you could do nothing. Right. So like like if, if you're not abiding, if you're not being with Jesus, if you're not experiencing Jesus love, are you just kind of leading ministry 
and just going through your day to day out of who you are and out of your own strength, right? But if you abide in Jesus, it's going to give you whatever you want, uh, both in ministry and in life, because your, your way of thinking is going to be in line with what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. You're not going to be praying for a million dollars, right? This is not, this is not one of those passages that says, oh, if you abide in Jesus, it's going to give you a million dollars. It's, you know, maybe the Lord wants you to win a lotto. I don't know. I don't think so. Um, but I, I think this is a promise that, that you're going to learn to hear his voice as you're in his presence. Um, and then I think a last implication there is, is that God wants you to bear fruit. But again, at the core of this is relationship with Jesus. So that, that's the main point that I'm trying to make, that when scripture looks at, at uh, our participation in the mission of God, relationship and love is, almost, is always at the core. And we see this again in like Luke 10, 17, 72 returned with joy. And he said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Right. Okay. So like, you know, think about that. These guys just came, came back from one of the most amazing times in ministry in the New Testament. Right. They, they went out. They, they cast out demons. They healed people. And Jesus affirms that. But he says, no, don't rejoice in that. I mean, that, that's a given, right? Like if you're with God, if you've got the power of the Holy Spirit in your life, that, that should be a given. That's going to happen. Uh, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice. Notice, focus on the fact that your names are written in heaven. So implication, Jesus affirms the advancement of his kingdom, but ultimately he's more concerned about our relationship with him and the fact that we belong to him. Amen? Um, give you another one, Matthew 7. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name drive out many, uh, perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, evil doers. Now, this one really scares me, okay? Uh, this is all in the context of uh, 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 listening to the commandments, doing the commandments, um, but what Jesus, is, I think the implications here is it is possible, check this out, to prophesy in the name of Jesus, to drive out demons in the name of Jesus, to perform miracles in the name of Jesus, and still not know who Jesus is. Still not have like awesome relationship with him. It, it's possible for him to like, like to turn you away, you know, like when, whenever that's going to happen. In other words, you can do great ministry and, and still not totally know who Jesus is. scary um this is another one of my favorites yes everything else is worthless when compared with knowing with the infinite value of knowing christ jesus my lord for his sake i had discarded everything else counting it all as garbage so that i could gain christ and what i love about this passage is what what is paul in the book of Philipp, philippians in chapter three boasting about he says uh I could have boasted about the fact that I was like a Jew of Jews circumcised on a certain day. I was like hardcore in my zeal for the Lord. I was, you know, a Pharisee, but all of that, all, all the things that would have made him a great Jew in the eyes of the people is like, all of that is worthless. The only thing that matters is knowing Jesus. And what I love about this passage, you know, um, uh, New Testament scholars go back and forth about this word, this word garbage, you know, in, 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 in some passages outside of scripture, that specific word in the Greek is like dog poop, you know, but, but like an expletive dog, shh, you know, and uh, some people are like, well, why, why would Paul, it, uh, why would Paul say that? And I think he's just trying to make a statement. Now, if you agree that it's a cuss word or not, it's not even the point. The point is everything else sucks, okay, in comparison to knowing who Jesus is, even the things that we think are awesome by society standards, right? I, uh, if I have a million dollars, if I have a house, I have like success and all those things. What he's saying is none of that matters. Just knowing Jesus, being in relationship with Jesus, that's all that really matters. It's the implication there. And then definitely my favorite, the book of Exodus, uh, when the people sin um, uh, with the golden calf, uh, there's a going back and forth between Moses and the Lord and the Lord says, okay, I won't destroy them. And then Moses says to the Lord, uh, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. 
How will anyone know that you're pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me from your people uh, and your people from all the other people on the face of the planet or the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do everything you ask for because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Uh, and the Lord's, you know, the Lord's response to him is, man, you can't see my glory. You know, no human being could be in my presence like that and live. Um, but what I, the, the reason that I put this passage here is because think about everything that Moses has seen up to this point in the book of Exodus. Think about the burning bush. Think about uh, the 10 plagues. Think about the crossing of the Red Sea. And in, in the midst of all of that, Moses has seen like uh, the glories and the miracles, the power of God displayed. But, but at this point, you know, uh, he says, I just want to see your glory. And, and the way that I interpret that is, I, I want to see just more, more of who you are, right? I want to see your face. In other words, this, this, this is a brother who has seen like God do some amazing power miracles more than any of us will have probably ever seen in our lives. But all he wants to do is just be completely in the presence of God. Isn't that beautiful? Um, let me stop sharing. So I'm not, I'm not going to have us uh, write, you know, in, in, in the table. I think that that would have worked a little bit better had there been more people. But like, what, what's your gut reaction to all these passages? And God's desire to, to have, just want to have a relationship with us and not get caught up in other things, even great ministry. Okay, can we take maybe a, time, a minute to like think about it? And then I'm going to invite Lisa to start us when we come back, okay? So one minute, Lisa. Everybody else, so just think about it. Like, what, What's your initial gut reaction to, to some of these passages? I think, um, I, you know, I've heard that story in Luke a bunch, but when you said that he didn't want us to, I mean, I know you didn't say it exactly this way, but not even celebrate the ministry as much as the relationship with him. I think that's, that really resonated with me because I just really do have a, a struggle sometimes in the whole performance of my job. And isn't Jesus happy with me because ministry is going well and, or is he not happy with me if ministry is not going well, you know, and all he wants is a relationship with me. Yeah. Yeah. We get really focused on the goals. Andrew, uh, this might come as a surprise to you, but as staff workers, we submit plans to our supervisors at the beginning of every year. And we set goals for the things that we want to see. Sometimes we pray about that. Sometimes, you know, we don't. Um, I'm not going to judge people. But what I'm saying is there's an expectation that we're going to carry out a plan, you know, and sometimes we can get really caught up in that, right? Uh, and it's very easy, actually, to get caught up in, in all those goals and goal settings. Uh, what, what else were the rest of you just resonating with with some of these passages? Taylor? Yeah, it feels like it's both like encouraging and challenging at the same time, where it's encouraging to know that like where my value is not in what happens ministry-wise, but like in my relationship with Jesus, and that's what like the standard God has, but then also it's like it's so easy to put other things as like the standard for how God feels about me. Um, I think particularly like ministry-wise, but like in other things as well. Um, I think that's like the challenging aspect of it is how do I continue to have the mindset that my value isn't found in like what I do or what I can accomplish. Okay. Awesome. Phil, Andrew. Yeah, you know, I I it's I feel like it's always a struggle of like my connection with God and like I, I honestly every time I go on a campus, I, I have this kind of ritual prayer that I pray, you know, like, Lord, be with me as I come on this campus. Use me if you can. Like, it's kind of a ritualistic kind of thing, but I just do it. Like, every time I go on a campus. I'm not going on a campus in a while. <laughs> you know, and so, like, what are, what are my practices that I can do in this season yeah. um, to remind myself? that I'm always doing this. And, and, and I think, you know, I think a piece of this is like, what does it look like? Um, yeah, just, I don't know that, that desire to just be with him to grow. Um, and not just in like, Lord, help me with this or Lord, yeah. let's do this. You know, like, it's like growing in that intimacy with Jesus is really what he's wanting for me. And, 
um, yeah, it's really, it's a good word. Any thoughts, Andrew? I think I've just like heard a lot and like know that the, the relationship with God gets emphasized a lot, but just never like realize as much until now, like how much it actually he actually talks about wanting a relationship with us and how much that like in the Bible he and Jesus talks about things he prioritizes wanting people to have a relationship with God over just doing things. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I don't, again, I'm not saying that any of the things that we do are bad Bible study, you know, awesome uh, evangelism. Think, think about all, all the ministry that's done on all of our campus. Those, those are great things, but I think sometimes we just mistake the mission and the doing, uh, for, for, you know, relationship with God. And, um, and then what ends up happening, right, Andrew, I've been on staff for almost 20 years now. Um, when you don't have mission at that level, when you graduate, you know, it's, we don't have all those structures, your large group meetings, you think about all the things that you all do on your campus. I don't know what, what it all looks like. When it all like gets taken out from you and you, ha and you don't have like an awesome prayer life and a devotional life, um, uh, recent alumni did just have like a, like a, a crisis of faith, a lot of them, right? Because, because they, they, they confused all the events, all the outreach, all that, just with the relationship with God, but behind the scenes, they weren't praying, you know? And, and I think for me, that's, that's dangerous because, uh, you know, we have the audacity to tell people, uh, uh, walk out of the kingdom of darkness and enter into the kingdom of light and experience the love of this gracious and you know God and King and this loving Father. But how many of us have actually spent time with that awesome, gracious Father and felt His love and remembered what it was like to you know to fall in love with Him uh, for the first time? You know, but but that's what we're we're we're, we're calling people into. But but sometimes we're not spending spending that relationship with Him. Uh, that, that time with him to, to build that, that relationship with him. So I think for me, um, it becomes an issue when everybody's all like self-isolating because then all of a sudden you don't have all those things like Phil was saying, right? Like Phil, you ain't going on campus for a bit, you know, for a minute. Um, so then all of a sudden, uh, does your prayer life sustain you during this time? You know, does, does, do, what, what do your conversations uh, with the father look like in the, in the midst of the crisis. Um, and I'll be honest with you guys. I, I initially, I was really, uh, hopeless and depressed. I think the first two weeks because everything that I do in planting, think about like, uh, this is, this is it, man. You know, this is my office. I tell people I live vicariously through all the people that, that I talk with on zoom, like zoom is all I know for the last two years. Right. So like, seriously, my, my life hasn't really changed like my day to day. Uh, other than the fact that I'm a, I'm a homeschool teacher now also, but I, I didn't see anything come in my paycheck for that part of my job, you know? Um, um, but, you know, in the day-to-day, -day, like, like, you know, nothing has really changed for me. I'm still, you know, on Zoom. Uh, but for some people, it's like, it's like torture, right? I don't know if you guys are feeling that, right? Like th those of you who are, who are used to being on campus. Um, but if, if you don't have a prayer life to sustain you, you know? Uh, and like I was telling you guys, I was totally hopeless because I was like, oh my gosh, people need to be on campus. Everything that I do uh, relies on people being on campus. All our resources in the planting department, right? Go and talk to your friends. Go and talk to your professor. In other words, uh, we don't have any of that. And I was just so depressed, you know? And, and, I, and I needed like, like, like remember to do all the things that, that I do to just like... Uh, uh, spice up my relationship with Jesus again, like to, to, to get me on fire for the Lord, you know? Uh, and, and for me, that's, that's been prayer and that's been studying scripture. So I took a, a day two weeks ago uh, to study the book of Ephesians. And uh, I, I, you know, uh, the Lord had led me a few weeks ago, a few months ago to start uh, translating the book of Ephesians from the Greek to the English and then doing an inductive study of my translation of the book of Ephesians, very nerdy stuff, okay? But what I'm trying to get there is, as I began to do that, 
boom, man, like, like the Holy Spirit just kind of like came on me and I got like all on fire again. And I've had like better perspective than I've had for like the last month, man, like reading CNN and watching the news, you know, and all that stuff, you know, it's information, but there's no, there's no hope there, you know? Um, so I've had to like go back to the basics, go back to prayer, go back to just like falling in love with Jesus all over again. Um, so I think, you know, practically speaking, right? Like how, how, how do we move forward in, in this? Uh, some of you have better, better prayer lives than others, but if, if your prayer life sucks right now, and if you're not, you know, having like Holy Spirit times, God, I love you, God, you love me type moments, like what do you do? Uh, and how do you help your fa- friends and family move forward in this? Um, let me go back to my, my PowerPoint real quick. Practically speaking, and I wish this were, were in PowerPoint form just because it's distracting to have all the numbers below. Uh, our primary concern should always be to love Jesus, right? Like I've been, I've been like hitting that drum for like 45 minutes now. Our primary concern is not just to teach Bible studies or to do evangelism or to plant. Yo, that's heretical for Innovar City staff. I just want you to know that's not our primary concern. Our primary concern is to help people fall in love with Jesus. Those, those other things that we do, just, those are just mechanisms. Uh, or, or, or ways of helping people. But our primary thing is to help people fall in love with Jesus, and we need to lead by example. Uh, everything that we do in ministry needs to flow out of love for Jesus. So, one, that's just a focus. Primary thing should be to, to love Jesus. Um, two, take an honest assessment of your prayer life. Like, where are you at? And have you all done that recently? Um, normally, in fact, I'll, I'll do this at this point. Some people tell me, like, w- when I give this type of training, teaching, like, focus on Jesus, spend time with the Lord, some people tell me, I, I don't have half an hour. So you know what I make them do? Is, uh, I'll make you guys do that right now. Pick up your phones real quick. Man, have you guys got your phones on you? If, if you're not on your phone, um, go look at the power consumption settings on your phone, right? Like your battery settings. So I got an iPhone. I open up settings. And there's a battery thing, bam, right there in green. And it'll tell you how much time you're spending on your phone and specifically what types of things you're doing on your phone. And people always tell me, I don't have half an hour, Abner. So I make them like look at their phone. All right. So what's um, show activity? Um, okay. Phil, what do you have at the top of your list of things that you've been doing on your phone? I'm still trying to find what you just said. Oh no. Okay. Uh, you got an iPhone? No, no. Uh, I, I don't know how to do Android. Uh, anybody okay. else got an iPhone and it has found your battery consumption settings? Oh my God. This is the first time. Uh, all right. So at some point later today, I think, sorry to interrupt you, but I think if you go into device care on your setting, do you have a Samsung, Phil? Yeah. That's where mine is. And then you go to device care and it shows your battery. I'm just kind of getting there too. Lisa, what do you have in your, in your battery care? So for me, if, if you guys don't find it, that's fine. Uh, for me, in the last 24 hours, the thing that has consumed my most time on my phone is Call of Duty Mobile. (laughs) I have spent 52 minutes in the last 24 hours uh, playing Call of Duty Mobile and about half an hour of praying. Now, I got my prayer time set up for later, so that'll, you know, cancel out. But even if I pray an hour, you know, half an hour, 45 minutes later today, uh, my guess is I'll, I'll still be playing, you know, Call of Duty Mobile sometime later today. So I play more Call of Duty than I spend time in prayer experiencing God's love for me. Okay, so m- making the case for myself even, right? Uh, anybody else have confessions? Like, what does your phone tell you? I have played Paper IO for 32 minutes. <laughs> That's your top one, Phil? That is my top one. Okay. That's not bad. 32 minutes. Yeah. 
Lisa, Andrew, Taylor, do you guys find it, find anything and are willing to share? No, you guys are having trouble. Okay. No, that's fine. Um, I love doing this exercise with, especially with students. Andrew, I'll be really honest with you. Uh, students always tell me I don't have enough time. And let me tell you, as somebody who has a full-time job, whose wife also has a full-time job, uh, who has two kids and two kids in school, uh, I can tell you with authority, right now you have the most time that you ever will in your entire life, brother. Okay? So now is the time, I'm thinking on you because you're the only student in, 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 in this call, but uh, now is the time to build up those muscles to spend time with Jesus. Right? Because when you graduate, Andrew, everything else is going to, ch is going to change. Uh, you're going to move back home if you don't move, you know, if you're not commuting. Uh, you, you're going to get, uh, you know, a full-time job. Uh, your group of friends, a network of friends is going to change. The only thing that won't change is God's love for you and your love for God. And you need to learn how to build up those spiritual muscles now. That is the most important thing that InterVarsity can give you. Okay? Because everything else, guess what? Your fellowship meetings, church is a little bit different. Okay? Uh, first of all, it's not made specifically for you. So that message on Sunday morning, uh, you might find that not every week is going to relate to you, okay? Uh, but that's fine because the body of God is, is bigger than just, you know, people in your age bracket. All that to say, the only thing that won't change, Andrew, is, uh, is God's presence in your life. And that's why we need to, you know, uh, enough picking on you, Andrew, sorry. But for the rest of us, right? Like, we understand that, like, the one constant thing in our lives is, is the Lord. Um, third thing is set goals for yourself and, and keep track. Right, like I, I mentioned in there, um, uh, James, James Chung and Ryan Pfeiffer's book, uh, "Longing for a Revival." If you look at pages one twelve to one fifteen in there, there's a really great section on ideas on how to just like pray and pray hard, uh, uh, pray day and night is, is the actual section. A lot of tangible examples in here about how to just really seek and contend with God and just be hardcore about it. Right. Um, James and Ryan do a really good job of talking about uh, that our job is to do everything that we can to make space for God to speak, but that God decides the Holy Spirit is the one that like, it does the real work. We just make the space in our schedule to make it happen, right? So nobody can say that it's uh, out of my works uh, that, that I got this awesome relationship with God. That's something that the Lord does, but we make space in our schedules for it. Uh, I mentioned to you guys that uh, one of the things that I took on was my was my uh, uh, prayer chart, right? So I'm, uh, give, I'm giving you guys access to a PDF copy of this. Um, really, it's really simple. I, I just print it out. Sometimes I print out a sheet with like uh, nine copies. So they're like they're this small. I cut them out. I put the dates at the top, you know, for the next six weeks. And then I just put it on my desk and one of the cubbies in my desk, I can't find it right now. So I have uh, one of the originals on the floor. Uh, the other thing that I've done is I put it on the refrigerator next to all my kids' chores, right? Like my kids have uh, chores in the refrigerator. I'll put my, 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 prayer, uh, my, my prayer chart on there because they need to know that I need to act right also, right? Uh, there have been other times where um, I do something very similar on, on Google Spreadsheets and I'll invite one of my friends uh, with me to to like keep track of what my prayer life looks like over the next month. So I'll I'll have like uh, you know the next thirty days, and then I'll put an X on each day that I prayed. And my commitment is five times a week, thirty minutes a day. I invite a friend, and uh, and I'll say if you notice that I go a week where I don't pray five times, you can text me and remind me to seek the Lord's face and to love Jesus and remind me that Jesus loves me and that I need to. Um, that I need to spend time with him, right? So it's accountability, it's goal setting. Um, some, some people think it's like, man, it's a little bit too hardcore. Is that what your relationship with God has, has become? I say yes, because I'm pretty childish in my ability to keep a consistent prayer time. So I'm just being honest with myself, you know, like that prayer chart and your guys' screen, it looks childish. I, I leave it automatically like that to remind myself that there are other strengths that, that I have and having a consistent prayer life um, isn't one of them. I 
almost always have to like remind myself to do it. Um, let me go back. <clears throat> the last thing on here is, you know, just do the things you did at first. Um, I don't know if all of you grew up in the church. If you've been believers your whole life, I'm going to assume that some of you on the call remember when you fell in love with Jesus, when you came to faith. Uh, what did you do at first? Uh, for me, I did a lot of journaling. And my journal is on the floor over there. I have, like I told you guys, my devotional. Um, I have my Bible all within reach. In fact, here's another journal. Bam, okay. Um, inductive Bible study, scripture study. I'll, sh I'll show you guys. No, I don't have time for that. I have all the, the software, you know. Why? Because during this time of pandemic, man, the world is falling apart. Uh, CNN. Fox News, they're telling me that like everything sucks and I just need to like seek the Lord and seek the Lord. You're, you're the one constant in my life. And if we're going to get through this time, uh, we, we need to continue being in the Lord's presence. Okay. I don't know if that's what you guys were expecting today. Uh, you came into a meeting about prayer, man, this guy, you know, just telling me to seek the Lord's face. That's all I have for you. But really, I, I have no doubt in my mind that, that if, if you guys hold to, to some of these things, uh, and have your family and your friends to hold some of these things. We're going to have a more hopeful, more joyful time. We're going to get perspective. We're going to have wisdom. Um, everything that you ask for, Jesus will give to you during this time, right? But we need to give him the space. Uh, I need to stop pick, playing Call of Duty. Um, giving more space to prayer and all the other things that I, that I talked about. But I'm going to make space maybe for the next five minutes for you guys to respond, maybe ask some questions and give me some feedback about what we talked about today. So why don't we do that? Phil, I'm going to pick on you again. Any, any thoughts or responses to what, we, what we've been talking about for the last 55 minutes? Yeah, it, you know, I, I think you're, you're spot on um, with, with prayer life. I mean, I don't know. I feel like um, I think the really the only thing that's changed for me, honestly, is I can't really leave my house too much because I've I've been living in a I've living been living crisis mode for a really long time, anyways. So that's just uh, something personal for me. Yeah. But um, and I've known that like in these hard times, if you're not connected to Jesus, it's it's just you know. It, you're going to go through a tailspin and, and all of the habitual sins that had weighed you down, you're going to get really sucked into those things. Um, and so those small steps of obedience is really what God is calling us to do. And um, yeah, I like the chart idea. I don't, I've never done the chart idea. Um, I'm going to try that. So. <laughs> and let your family see it, bro. You know, yeah. let your yep. family see it. Um, um, or, you know, create something on, on Google spreadsheets or, you know, Google files or something like that and invite people that you trust, you know, to join you, uh, who you're not going to get offended when they text you at 1am and tell you, Phil, I noticed that you haven't prayed like that, you know, that you're not going to get mad and defensive or anything like that. So, uh, one of my prayer partners in the past has been Eric Rafferty, who's also on the planting team. And at one point, um, um, uh, he had like, 20 something days of consistent prayer and i was like dude you're a rock star bro he has three kids right so i'm like man like i i, I say five days because for me on weekends my schedule just changes you know what i mean so i, I give myself a little bit of of, of leeway um uh, by saying five days but eric went like yeah i think it was like 23 or 24 days something like that straight just like being with jesus and and his prayer life was different. You know, when I would talk to him, he would tell me all the things that the Lord uh, was putting on his heart. And it was just awesome. Uh, any other just uh, responses at the end here? All right, y'all. Uh, this is what I want you to do. If you still have access to that Google file, just go, go and write in it. Um, keep yourself accountable. Right. If you scroll down to the bottom, how's God inv inviting you to respond? So personally, what do you want to commit to? 
over the next two weeks? Like, what do you feel like the Lord wants you to do as we move forward here? And then while you guys are doing that, I'm going to go into my Google Drive and give you access to the full folder. Uh, I think we have time, you know, two minutes. Why don't we go around in order? Taylor, Andrew, Lisa, what are things that you feel like the Lord is asking you to commit to? Yeah, so I think I want to set um, goals for healthy spiritual practices. Um, and so the three that I had on that, um, we're going to do prayer, Bible reading, and then like a nightly exam kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then have some sort of like a way to track that. Okay. Uh, an another way to go about this, uh, Taylor, is uh, you, could do, you could do a Google search on uh, uh, crafting a rule of life right, that will help you come up with like a game plan that you, for the next three three to six months if you want to organize yourself a little bit better. And there's there are templates online that will help allow you to do that. Uh, in, in my core classes at Fuller Seminary, uh, I was required to write a rule of life as my final uh, project for like five of my classes, I think it was. And it was very, very... Um, uh, it, it helped me to have a consistent prayer life and to put into practice the things that I was learning in class. So <laughs> Phil has committed to his prayer chart. Uh, Andrew consistent, consistently spent time with him at least every day, getting to know him. So feeling the Lord kind of stirring you to that. Yeah, just kind of like, I feel like a lot of my quiet time recently has just been like asking for, yeah a lot of stuff and a lot of me talking and not a bunch of me listening and so I kind of feel like I need to spend more time just actually getting to know God and like finding his character during quiet time in addition mm -hmm. to what I'm doing already. Awesome. Thank, thanks Andrew for sharing. Lisa, how, how do you feel the Lord's asking you to respond? I think for me, um, especially, I don't know if it was you or Phil that said something about being able, like when you're isolated, you know, you can just get really into a, like kind of a downward spiral or a bad pattern. So just getting accountability for that, especially in this particular time, it's just, you know, you could just go off the rails really easily. I could, and I don't want to do that. Um, I don't want that to be my pandemic story. So <laughs> just getting accountability in like, permanently but specifically in this these moments awesome well let me pray a blessing over you guys and we'll log off we're already a minute over just want to be mindful uh, of you guys' schedules uh lord i thank you that you're a god of relationship lord thank you that uh, my sister and my brothers logged in today uh lord i pray that you would uh help them move forward with their plan lord whether it's spending more time with you getting a some kind of rule of life getting accountability in prayer uh, Lord, I pray that those times with you would be life-giving. I pray that those times with you wouldn't just be about ministry tasks or my to-do list, but God, that there would be times where they would see your face, Lord God. God, that where they would experience your grace, your, 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 all your love uh, for them, Lord. And God, that out of that, they would be able to minister to the world. That out of that, they would be able to have words of wisdom and words of comfort in the midst of this pandemic. So, Lord, we, we lift you up. God, we worship you. We thank you. And I pray a blessing over their families and their households and their friends, Lord. God, would you keep them uh, safe? And, Lord, would you keep them uh, seeking your face over these next few weeks? Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank right. you, Abner. Yeah, it's good, good, good to see you guys. Hopefully we connect at some point, not in the middle of the pandemic. <laughs> All right, you guys, uh, it's good meeting you. Take care. Have a great day.